The topic of this video deals with four kinds of non-canonical clauses. There are four different processes, not only four, but there are four processes we're going to look at today whereby you can make a non-canonical clause. Those are preposing, postposing, extraposition, and dislocation. And there are two kinds of dislocation, so we could actually say that there are five. Let's think for a minute about back to canonical clauses, because we've talked about them two or three times in the semester. This exercise, this video should help you with exercise one and exercise 11 of chapter 15. But for exercise one, you're going to have to actually think back also to earlier times when we talked about canonical clauses. And I recommend using the index just look up canonical and then go back to the sections that are named there. You'll remember that clause can be non-canonical for a lot of reasons, right? Canonical is the default. There are a lot of ways we can go off of the default. So maybe you remember that if you make a clause negative, it's not canonical anymore. The canonical ones are positive. The canonical ones are declarative. <clears throat> So if you make it interrogative or exclamative, imperative, anything that's not declarative, those are also non-canonical. So think about that when you're doing exercise one. But then this chapter, chapter 15, also showed you other ways, new ways that you can make a clause non-canonical. And these are, of course, operations that you're familiar with doing as fluent speakers of the language. The only problem is being able to be conscious of them such that you can identify them. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about what are the characteristics whereby we can identify clauses that are preposed or postposed, dislocated or extraposed. Let's go first to preposing and postposing. Now, in some of the other operations, you're going to see that we add something to a clause or take it out. In preposing and postposing, you don't add or take out a single thing. That's the main characteristic whereby you can identify it. That's one of the two main characteristics whereby you can identify it. Nothing's added or taken out. Something is just moved. If something's preposed, it goes to the beginning, it's gone to the beginning of the sentence. If it's postposed, it's gone to the end of the sentence. Here are some examples of Preposing, not the first sentence, that's canonical. Princess Snow and her friends had many adventures as they visited each of the twelve kingdoms and collected the twelve keys. Now look at the sentence. Some they got by persuasion. Stop right there with that clause. Some they got by persuasion. Now look at the verb. Got, right? What do you see before the verb? You know what you should see, right? You should see a subject. Now, do you see a subject there? They. They is a subject. And is some part of the noun phrase? Is it some they? Is some they the subject of got? No, that would be silly, right? Some they isn't a phrase at all. Some is a phrase by itself. So why is there a noun phrase in front of the subject? What is that thing doing there? Can you put it in a different place? Pause if you need to. We could move it to after the verb. They got some by persuasion. And in fact, that actually sounds really natural, doesn't it? They got some by persuasion. If we didn't have a context, if we didn't have the first sentence, that's probably how we would have done that. It would be some, a they subject, got verb, some direct object. It would be the, the default order. The clause would be canonical. Why is the clause not canonical? Why is the direct object first? Well, that's a question of style, right? And a question of emphasis. And there are many reasons that we can choose to put the object first. And they have to do with choices about what we want to emphasize in the sentence and stuff like that. If you take an object or any other thing that should come later in the sentence and you move it to the front of the sentence before the subject, then your clause has now, your clause is now 
preposed. And the analysis is going to ask you to identify the preposed element. Actually, for each of these, one of the analyses, I think it's 11, is going to ask you to identify the affected element. So for each of these kinds of clauses, I want you to also practice naming the thing that is affected. In this case, the thing that is preposed. So if I asked you to analyze this clause, some they got by persuasion. Here's what I'd like you to say. This clause exhibits preposing. The preposed element is some. Don't try to say the preposed element is the whole clause. It's asking you what's the thing that got moved. If it's asking you for the element that's affected, it's asking you for what's the thing that got moved, right? The thing that got moved is some. Canonically, in its default position, it was after the verb. They got some by persuasion. Now, skip the middle phrase because there's elision in there. There's things that are not overt, and so that one could be analyzed, but let's not, okay? Let's do the last one. Some they took in battle. Same thing, right? They took some in battle is canonical. Some they took in battle is a clause that exhibits preposing. The preposed element is some. Okay? That is an example of preposing. And now you can guess what postposing is, right? Or you can imagine a sentence. We already talked about what it is, but you can imagine a sentence with postposing. Remember, nothing will be added. Nothing will be taken out, but something will be moved. In this case, it'll go to the end. Explain to me the premise of this one. Now, why is this clause not canonical? What would the canonical version be? Think about this. Um, he gave a horse to his sister. That sounds natural, right? That's canonical. What are the elements in that sentence? There's he, the subject. There's gave the verb. A horse is the direct object, right? And then to his sister is another compliment, but it's a preposition. Prepositional phrase, right? To his sister, it's a prepositional phrase. So that direct object noun phrase is going to come right after the verb. Now, is it possible to say he gave to his sister a horse? Possible, but weird, right? It's not canonical. It's not in default. Usually we get the direct object coming directly after the verb. So look at this sentence again. Explain what's the direct object? The premise of this one. So canonically, this one would be explain the premise of this one to me. Now, it sounds better the other way, doesn't it? That's the thing. Um, preposing and postposing, they're done for a reason. We don't do them randomly. Usually, if we do them, we end up with a better sounding clause stylistically. So just because it sounds weird, the canonical way, don't think that the, don't think that the best sounding stylistic way is canonical. That has nothing to do with it. Canonical isn't about style. It's about structure. So here we have something that should be, explain the premise of this one to me. And we find the premise of this one instead at the end of the sentence. So we say that this clause exhibits postposing. And the postpose element is the premise of this one. That's the thing that got moved. But note that nothing got added or taken out. You have exactly the same words that you have in the canonical version. Explain the premise of this one to me. So presposing and postposing don't add anything to the sentence. And so look at these sentences. So my kids, they will have their chance. My son, I think he leaves around noon. Okay, let's do the second one first. My son, I think he leaves around noon. What's the canonical version of that? I think my son leaves around noon. Do you see something extra in the non-canonical version? 
Is it just the fact that my son got taken out and pre-posed? I th my son, I think, leaves around noon. No, there's something extra there that he wasn't in the canonical version. How about the first one? My kids will have their chance. My kids, they will have their chance. There's an extra word there. So this can't be preposing. This can't be preposing. In preposing, nothing gets added. What this is, is dislocation. The canonical version, so my kids will have their chance. Left dislocation, you take out something and you put it to the beginning. Right? Left is a term that's biased towards writing systems like that of English where you start from, where you go from left to right. It's not really fair to other languages, but that's kind of another issue for another day. The point here is that you take something out, you put it to the beginning of a sentence, but crucially, you stick something else in its place. And almost always it's a noun phrase that you take out and it's a pronoun that you stick in. That may be actually always. I'm not sure if it's always, always, almost always, or always, always. So the other one, my son, I think he leaves around noon. That's dis left dislocation. If you just said my son, I think, leaves around noon, that would be canonical. And what's going on here? Can you figure this one out? He never was a great listener. It's fine, right? And there's something stuck on the end. He's paranoid is fine, but there's something stuck on the end. And those things should really be the subject of the sentence, right? My father never was a great listener, canonical. My boss is paranoid, canonical. But those things got moved, and they got replaced by a pronoun, and the only difference between these and left dislocation is what? It's just that they got moved to the other side. They got moved to the end instead of the beginning. So what is this? It's just right dislocation. Same thing. You can do it either way. Just remember in both cases with dislocation, the thing that gets taken out gets replaced in its original place by a pronoun. So you have pre-posing and post-posing in both directions of dislocation. Now here's another phenomenon. What do you see happening here? Focus on the subject of this sentence and think about how we would analyze it. Think specifically about the referent of it. The main clause, in the main clause, is is a verb and it is a subject, right? What does that it stand for? What is still true? Now you see your answer after that you see your answer at the end of the clause, right? That writers, even successful ones, often do other things with their lives is still true. That's the canonical version of this clause. So what happened? The subject, right, is this a verb, right? This is kind of a hard sentence because of its length. So focus on this. Is this a verb? Still true is just a predicate complement. That part is not so bad. The only tricky thing is that everything before is is a subject. That whole clause. Right? Finite clauses can be subjects too. They are a lot of times. That writers, even successful ones, often do other things with their lives. Now you may not like that sentence stylistically. You may like the extra pose diversion better. We extrapose for a reason. A lot of times it improves the style. It's easier for the brain to process as the theory. But let's not go into all that. Let's analyze exactly what happened. That subject got moved to its place at the end of the sentence, right? After the predicate complement, after the clause is all done, that subject goes there. And then is there a blank place where it used to be? No, not possible in English. We have to put something in there, even if it's a pronoun that doesn't have any meaning. It just holds the place for that clause. So we use it, and it's just a dummy pronoun here. It really doesn't reference anything, but you can test for extra position because in most cases, that it could be replaced with the thing that's extraposed, which is to say it's put at the end of the sentence. 
Now you can extrapose both subjects and objects. You'll see an object example in a minute, but you don't extrapose left. They always go to the end of the sentence. So here you see an extraposed subject, and you see the two key principles of extraposition. A thing is taken out and moved to the end of the sentence. In the thing's original place, you see the word it, and it's just a dummy pronoun holding the place. Here is another example. Analysis clause. Can you make a canonical version? Okay, here's my analysis. Canonical version is maybe that our resistance to change is balanced by the fact that one human lifetime is too short for anyone to notice many of the grandest changes in nature is fortunate. <laughs> That's really a bad sentence, right? But it's grammatical. It's just bad stylistically. The extraposed version is much, much better. One of the reasons that extraposition works is that we like the important stuff to come at the end of the sentence. And so when there's something that's complicated and we want to take our time with it, we want it to come at the end of the sentence and then we're done. So a lot of times reasons, the reason for extraposing is that the subject or object is a really long clause. That'll make it go extraposed. But you don't need to know the reasons. You just need to be able to identify when it happened. And you can tell that it happened here because it's not in its original place, and in its original place is the dummy pronoun it. Mm. Now here, you can see a couple examples of extraposed objects. Bob, I thought I made it clear to you that I'm on vacation. Now, do you see the it? The it means what? What did he make clear? It's that I'm on vacation, right? Same thing with the second one. Is it possible that rather than processing the words, they just repeated them? What is, what are the thing that they're asking if it's possible? What's the thing that they're asking if it's possible? Rather than processing the words, they just repeated them. Is rather than processing the words, they just repeated them possible? Now, here is one reason why we know that extraposition is not the same as just right dislocation, in which you also move something to the right and replace it with a pronoun. But here is one of the reasons why we know that dislocation is different and that it's using just a dummy pronoun. And that reason is that in some cases, you can't make a canonical version. In the, in the um, dislocated sentences, whether it's left or right, you can always do a canonical version. But with Extraposition, a lot of times you can't. Sometimes with the subject extraposition you can't, and almost always with object extraposition you can't. If we try with these sentences, look at this. Bob, I thought I made that I'm on vacation clear to you. <laughs> That's not just stylistically bad. People just don't do that. And is that, rather than processing the words, they just repeated them, possible. We just don't do it that way. Those are actually ungrammatical. So, when you see a something that's been moved out to the end of the sentence and it's replaced by a pronoun, if the pronoun is not it, then that has to be right dislocation. If the pronoun is it, then consider are you dealing with extraposition or right dislocation? If you're dealing with extraposition, that it is just a dummy pronoun. It doesn't really stand for that thing. And if it's an object, you won't be able to make a canonical version. If it's right dislocation, you'll always be able to make a canonical version. And then just one final thing I want to say to you to be careful of that's not really related to the subject matter. It's just related to exercise one, the directions. Please do pay attention to the fact that it asks you to analyze each of the main clauses. It says for each of the main clauses below. So please don't say that any of those clauses are non-canonical because they're subordinate. It's asking, not asking you to look at the subordinate clauses. There are some subordinate clauses contained inside main clauses. But a subordinate clause inside a main clause doesn't make the main clause canonical or non-canonical. Right? If it, it's asking you to look